Trevor. Welcome to the Regional Football Hub. We certainly appreciate you taking time out of your day to share your journey and discuss uh, football with us. I'm sure our many viewers will appreciate your insights that, uh, that you have from coaching at the levels you've, that you've been able to coach at. So thanks for joining us. Pleasure. No problem. Thanks for Just to me. kick off, uh, what was the first club that uh, you first played with as a youngster back in the day? Yeah, back in the day, um, under sevens or something like that. It, um, <clears throat> I grew up in the Blue Mountains, so it was uh, Hazelbrook Hawks. Um, uh, a little bit of a Man City look there, a bit of sky blue <laughs> white. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a little multi purpose oval nestled in, in amongst some, um, some uh, gully, yeah, like in a gully. Um, freezing cold, 11 aside, under sevens, oh. um, muddy pitch. Um, yeah, love it. Love it. Beautiful. And obviously back up there, what was your uh, experience through high school like at Springwood? Yeah, oh, schooling was great. Um, if you're talking about a football experience, it wasn't great. Um, it certainly wasn't a football rich area. It was an area where um, artists and, and um, you know, I guess people with alternate lifestyles like to get away from the city. So uh, there were football clubs, but it wasn't... Um, that there was a real wealth of um, passionate footballers where I grew up. Uh, there were, you know, I, I was always involved in playing, but it just wasn't the same as, um, uh, you know, yeah, a strong, a strong football culture. It was very, very relaxed, very laid back, very um, arty farty type of place to grow up. And um, yeah, so uh, the school was great. Uh, great high school, enjoyed my time there. And, um, you know, uh, had some lifelong friends out of it. Uh, but but needed to move on. Sorry, there's some noise in the background. Apologies there. It's all right. Um, and then you went to CSU in Bathurst to become a teacher. What was your footballing and study lifestyle like there? Yeah, so that was very exciting. Um, it wasn't my plan, to be honest. Um, I, I planned to, to study phys ed um, at Karingai in Sydney. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I guess the final HSC results, uh, it, it, was a, it was a course that had the highest uh, ranking, so I missed out. And um, the opportunity came up to go to Bathurst. And what was exciting was that, um, firstly, it was the first phys ed degree that, Bathurst, uh, that CSU Bathurst had run. It was, they'd previously run a sports science course and um, physical education became, uh, we were the first intake. So the actual lecturers were excited to, to start their new during uh, running that course um, and it brought people from all over um, and obviously the great thing is I needed to move away from home so I had to live full time there make new friends um, and grow up a lot which, which, which was fantastic. Cool. So you played some football at uh, Bath 75 when you were at CSU at Bathurst. What was your football experience like and Joe Judge is seen as one of the most um, revered coaches in, in this Western New South Wales area. What was your experience with Joe from a coaching ex perspective as well? Yeah, so, I mean, Judgy, you can't mention his name without putting a smile on your face. <laughs> from the, from the, the club perspective, um, at the time when I joined Bathurst 75, uh, you know, I did a year or so at the, the university and then, then went to Bathurst 75. I think um, the club had a great, you know, for the small club that it is, it had a great culture, a great history. Um, there's a lot of pride in, in playing for that team, especially from all the, the local boys who who um, liked to go to Sydney every second weekend and take a scalp. Um, there were certainly some outstanding footballers uh, and, um, and great dedication. So it was very, very enjoyable. Um, a good competitive environment. People worked hard. Um, we, we were certainly out to um, play in a proactive manner on the weekend and, and compete with people. And uh, so that was very enjoyable. But I think, so that, that, that is down to the club. Um, but at the same time, it was, um, it was led by Joe, who, uh, as a lecturer at the university, as an ex-gymnast, ex-footballer, um, inspirational character, one of the most intelligent men I've ever met. Um, it was just a, it, we just had a great time. We, we, wanted to, we wanted to run through walls for him. We learned so much. I, I would actually say I had one short bit of coaching in, in Sydney when I was growing up that was of a good level, but really Judgey was the first really intelligent, structured, um, 
uh, football experience that I had was was training under him, and and so um, yeah, probably a little bit late to try and make a career, but um, <laughs> but a huge stimulus to um, uh, to get better at the game and think about the game in another way. Cool. When and how did it land in your head that coaching is what I want to do? Yeah, so growing up in high school, I'd always been in leadership roles in in, in um, you know uh, that type of thing and like interacting with kids. Um, I think when I was 16 or 17, I was coaching the under 11s at my local club uh, in my spare time. Um, just, I guess, out of interest of um, could it help them a little bit and there was a, a team without a coach. Uh, but once I made a decision to be a phys ed teacher, then coaching of some sort, teaching coaching of some sort was gonna be there. Um, so, but in particular, I think it was in our second year of university that we had to do a work placement and, and rec, um, try and get 80 hours of, of practicum. And Joe arranged for myself and, and you know, my best mate, Paul Ivers, we went to um, what was then a talent athlete program camp where they brought kids from all over New South Wales. They lived in at Narrabeen for seven or eight days. Um, and, uh, you know, so you had kids from, from Griffith, you had kids from northern New South Wales, you had kids from Bathurst, you had uh, yeah. uh, everywhere, um, the south coast, all coming in and competing against the, um, the, the city-based kids. Um, and that was 1990, around about the time of Italia 90. Um, yeah. And it was, I remember it clearly because um, uh, Paul Ocon was about to leave to go and play at Fiorentina. Um, he dropped in at the camp. Um, uh, Bertie Mariani dropped in at the camp, but the first group of players was um, was your was your Harry Kuehl's, Brett Evanson's. I think Archie was even at that camp. So yeah. um, my first taste of potentially being involved in elite youth development was with with some of the some of the, the future Socceroos uh, in a, in a really highly motivated, well organised camp. Um, and from then on, then it was no question what I wanted to do. Magic. What would you say your biggest challenges in your coaching career so far have been and how have you dealt with them? Yeah, so good question, Kyle. Um, I think uh, not being, not being a, an established figure in the game in terms of being a high-profile uh, person means that sometimes the roles that come to you um, uh, come with more challenges. Uh, you, you, you're in the league, but but you uh, maybe have the lesser budget. Um, so that's often been one for me uh, with a little bit less support. Um, sometimes missing out on, on, on roles that you would like to, to challenge yourself with uh, and, and um, people who maybe uh, have that other football experience of being top level players are preferred for that position. And I think, to be fair, we have to accept that. They've put their life into the game. They've proved that they can do it for a career as, as on the pitch. And if they show a real love and passion to be a coach. I think we have to accept that they, they bring with them a huge skill set. But probably the fact that I had to, the, a lot of the roles I've had have been um, where you, you are the underdog. Um, but from the, from the positive side, that means you have to be very creative in your coaching. You have to find solutions. You, you have to... Uh, really, really develop your coaching quality because you can't find the answer in the budget. Okay. So I think if you've proven that you can achieve that, do you think that it changes at some point? So obviously you've been able to coach Australia's um, youth squads um, and obviously spent some time in South Coast Wolves, et cetera. At some point, does that change so that the non-status of having a playing name changes because you now have a coaching name? Does it become a point where that happens? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. Um, obviously now, you know, uh, the current role I'm in, I'm, I'm, um, I'm tremendously proud of uh, the opportunity to, to work for my country. Uh, so I suppose that affords me some um, uh, credibility in the game, but I think I had to earn that along the way. I think whichever next step I take, I'm going to be now swimming amongst the best fish. So um, I think you have to prove yourself every time, uh, regardless. And I, and I also think there's that pre that positive pressure on people who are who've had a top footballing history as a player because they they also carry some pressure of oh let's see what he can do. Yeah, we know he can play. So, um, but yeah, I, I think um, it's uh, 
it's an honor to have that type of role and it's something that you um you should be every day looking to prove that you should be there you should be the same as a player you you want to set high standards so you mentioned joe is someone who helped you early on is there anyone else who was perhaps a mentor or someone you leaned on and has it changed uh, across your coaching journey in, in terms of you relying on a, a mentor and people that you've had that have influenced your coaching pathway? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, uh, to put it simply, there's three wise men. One of them was Judgy. Um, uh, and, um, you know, when I got the role to take the, the Joeys, I really enjoyed ringing up Judgy and telling him. Uh, it meant a lot to me. Uh, he introduced me to David Lee, who ran... Uh, an unbelievable program at Football New South Wales. Even now, I think um, it was in the pen and paper.com era. It was um, sending in faxes, phone calls, checking pieces of paper, but there was a lot of detail to what we did. And that, that, that really started with, um, you know, right down to Harry's generation, but, you know, to the, the generation of the Alex Frosks and those sorts of players, um, to uh, the team that went to the 1999 World Cup uh, under-17 final, there were so many players that had come through the New South Wales program in that way. Uh, right through now to, um, you know, some guys who finished their career are now coaching. Um, so those were two, but probably the biggest influence has been uh, Casey De Bruin. Um, so Case, um, of all things, uh, was my instructor for my level two and my level three. Um, and I actually failed my level two. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I didn't pass my session. I had to be reassessed. I had to do the whole course again. Um, Casey eventually assessed me for my level three and, and, and I, I got through. Um, and um, ever since then, we, we actually worked together quite a lot. It was, uh, I went overseas, I came back uh, and asked Casey for a reference for a job. And as it turns out, uh, while visiting to, to, to get a reference for a job, I actually met his daughter, ended up marrying his daughter. Um, but Case and I have married, uh, sorry, have worked together for, I think, since 1997. Uh, and he's continued on the journey at Westfield Sports High School. He obviously came to the World Cup as assistant coach. Uh, we got through the Asian Cup together. He's coming up on 74 this year, but his desire for learning, for trying new things, for researching, for detail, uh, his passion for affecting players, his competitiveness, um, his honesty, uh, his commitment. They're all qualities that have not actually dropped off as he's gotten older. They've just continued and, and some of them have, have gone to another level. So um, if I think about Joe Judge, David Lee and Casey as the main influences on my career, um, they certainly got me to a fairly high level. Then I was then I was fortunate to work in the A League or work with national teams. So then I've worked with with Graham Arnold. Then I've worked with Paul. Yeah. Lebron, then I've worked with Tony Popovich. Then I've worked with Ian Crook. So uh, Ante Milicic, uh, fantastic people in the game. Um, but if I hadn't had the help of the three wise men, I don't think I would uh, I would be there. Beautiful. Awesome. Obviously, you speak about those three mentors that you had. How important do you think, obviously not just for yourself, but for everyone, it is to find a mentor or as many mentors as they can to lean off, for either, whether it's their playing or coaching career? Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, uh, in a way, everyone needs their dad if they have one. You know what I mean? Um, you need that person who uh, is with you in good times and bad someone who sometimes if you get caught in a moment and worrying about what's happening in the moment, that person can take a step back for you and say, you know what, look what you're doing, it's doing well, or you know what, it actually wasn't that bad. Uh, so I think for players, uh, for coaches, for anybody in life, I think it's important to have, you know, what they often call a critical friend. Um, and if you have a couple that, um, and I think what's great is if they, if they're different to each other, they have a different perspective. If they have the same level of care and personal responsibility to be loyal to you, then, then I think you're in, in an ideal situation. Different perspectives, no one uh, doing anything other than trying to help you. Um, but yeah, vital, vital to progress. Yep. Have you become a mentor yourself? Uh, I guess you'd have to ask the young coaches that I work with. Um, <laughs> But uh, look, I, I do a, a little bit of um, uh, work still with Westfield Sports High School um, and officially they named it as a coach mentor role, but really it's, um, it's watching 
17 different sports coaches work uh, in, in different fields and, and thinking if I was in their shoes, I might not know their sport, but if I was in their shoes, what could the school do better to support them? How could we extend their program further? And a lot of that comes down to uh, chat over a cup of tea or coffee and, and you know, what do they need? Uh, some of that comes down to filming sessions and discussing it. Some of it runs in, in teachers' professional learning. Um, but yeah, I'd like to think that I don't know that I am a formal mentor for someone, but um, I always try to give my time to a young coach who, you know, who um, I may have a chance to help. Awesome. And you mentioned earlier the um, you went to the under 17 World Cup. What were the key things you took from that experience? Uh, I, I, I want I want Aussies to be seen to be good enough. Um, I believe they are. I think we have, um, we still have talent in our country. Uh, they're talented young kids. I think we, we obviously are going through a big process at the moment of how do we do things better? What are the structure of the game? Um, it has everything in, in, the, in the football environment in Australia. Um, but there's no question that we have um, players good enough to compete on that stage. And I think my, my biggest challenge is to uh, reflect upon the tournament, look at the next group of players coming through and even the group after that and, and try and give them some guidance that they might just be um, a few percent better individually um, so that so when they go to perform, they're, they're, they're playing with so much confidence, um, self-confidence, confidence in each other. Um, they're prepared to show their quality. Uh, they're, they're, they're very sure they can make their own decisions on the pitch. So uh, that's, that's one learning. The other thing is, to be honest, boys, um, when we ran into France um, and we lost that uh, round of 16 match, uh, there were periods in the game where we, where we, we had um, chances to score. There were three chances before half time. Uh, then we had a send off after half time and it, and it, and it looks a bit, um, a bit not so tidy at the end. But being honest, the, the captain of France was training with Neymar before he came to the World Cup. And, and, and when they got knocked out of the World Cup, he flies back and, he's, and, and, and immediately there's photos of him training with PSG first team. The centre-back from the French team um, is, uh, is playing for PSG first team. Uh, the full-back from Brazil, uh, who we played in September last year, is now going to Man City. The, the, the striker from, uh, sorry, the winger from Brazil was Golden Ball. Those players, um, what we need is for our players to have access to an environment, a super competitive environment, senior football, more match minutes, all of the stuff you know that, that everyone's searching for at the moment. Because if we provide that, um, there's every chance that a kid from Australia can be top class. And, and you've only got to look back to... Um, you know, the, the fact that in the past there have been top players, whether it's right back to a Craig Johnson, whether it's a, whether it's a Harry Kuehl or a Viduka, um, whether it's currently now an Aaron Moy, um, we have players who can play in that league. And it's, it's a matter of um, giving them exposure as early as possible and letting them adapt to that environment. And, um, yeah, so I have a great deal of belief, um, but definitely the tournament showed you. I, I walked down the tunnel at halftime behind the French team and, uh, and they were men. You, the shoulders, the hips, the thighs, uh, they were physically uh, more developed than my players. But, but why wouldn't you be if you're training with the first team in, in, you know, in League One? So there's some good learnings there, especially um, the obviously young players playing more and playing at a, a good level and with good players. What um, do you think going forward, are we in a better position to keep qualifying and continuing to give players opportunity to to keep exposing themselves to that high level of football? Oh, look, the, the thing is you take learnings out of anything, Andrew, but uh, each group is a new group. Uh, so uh, they have to face the same challenges. Then there's circumstances like uh, we should have an Asian Cup in September. We still don't know if it's on. Is it pushed to 2021? Um, uh, what's the draw like? Who do we get? What are the weather conditions? It, it's a huge challenge to qualify through Asia. Um, because of the the newness of the environment, that how it changes in different parts of Asia for us. So, firstly, you've got to qualify. We might be more educated, but that doesn't guarantee you can manage everything that happens on a, on a match day. Um, and then 
going to the World Cup, I can promise you every other country in the world, especially that top 20, they, they want to be the best. I'm not sure that all of the top uh, football nations in the world really worried too much about the Youth World Cup 25 years ago. Um, but the more it's going, they see it as a, a way to, to showcase their talent. Uh, it's another trophy to win. So they want to do that. So it's actually, it's, I think it's going to continue to get harder and harder. Yeah. I suppose from the World Cup experience, did you see any key changes in the way that the game was played at all from previous years? No, I think, I think the general trend around the world is everyone's learning from each other. Um, I think whilst you could say, you know, South American football tends to be slightly different to, to European football, and that was the case. Um, certainly uh, Ecuador against us were able to um, control the tempo and take the heat out of the game if they wanted to. Uh, that was something they were quite, quite good at. Um, uh, I think, you know, France... France went on the pitch with a 4-2-3-1, but at times it looked like a 4-4-2. They definitely had midfielders um, coming out into pockets and creating a wide rotation. Um, that's, that's nothing new at all. But they did it quick. They did it very quick. They did it repeatedly. Their passing was accurate. Um, uh, so I think teams are more flexible now in terms of changing formation. Um, but I think at that World Cup level, they're, even at under-17s, which which is, um, is obviously not the highest level, you know, of underage football. Under-20s and, and the Olympic Games, are, are they're, they're more pros by then. Um, they're still outstanding individuals, yeah? They're still people that, that really, um, you know, so quite a few boys, I would say well above 20 boys returned from that World Cup and went straight back into playing first-team football in their country. Uh, so, you know, and, and top leagues like the Brazilian League. Um, yeah. Hopefully that answers that one for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good learnings there for, for players. I mean, do you reflect on what you learned for yourself and and collectively as a staff from having experienced that World Cup? I mean, it's obviously a great experience and a good test. Um, what do you learn coaching wise for yourself after being able to participate in that kind of a tournament? Yeah, a lot of learnings. Um, I think at the end of the day. Uh, you, you you learn that um, you need to do your preparation as well as possible. You need to stick with your philosophy, and mine is very strongly on on player centred uh, football. So that as a coach, um, I try and give guidance, but along the way, I give a lot of responsibility to my players in camp, um, leading into matches, uh, because I want them to be active decision makers, and I wouldn't change that for the world. Um, uh, I think you stick with your process, you evolve, you, you be curious and you try and improve. Um, but what won't change, if, while ever I'm, I'm um, holding the clipboard for the Joeys, is that I want players to come in, know their strengths, know each other very well, have a good understanding of, of, of our um, principles of play, which, you know, are, are simple things, right? Creating width. Um, I don't want to be regimented that the number seven always must. I want them to understand that uh, we need to be uh, structured, we need to be organised, but we need to have opportunity. Uh, they need to need to express themselves. So that won't change. And I think then all it is is um, preparing the players the best you can and and making them making them ready to go for the throat. That they they want to go to that game and they're excited. Whoever it is that they think I'm gonna I'm gonna go toe to toe with you. I've no fear of you. Yeah, great. With your coaches, so how do you engage your assistant coaches? Do you assign roles? How, how, does, how does your management of your staff work? Yeah, uh, good one. Uh, so right back in the beginning when I took over the Joeys, uh, the first thing I did was I actually brought in an HR speci specialist and, and um, uh, he ran some, some seminar work with them and then he came back for several camps and did some individual work where... Um, his interest was to, for them to develop their own personal development plan, what they yep. wanted to achieve in their career, and then they need to use the experience in the Joeys to hone that craft. Certainly the way we do things, we tended to meet uh, every night, um, review the day, plan the next day, and that would be everyone would be in it. So uh, some coaches don't do that, but I, I would have my physio, my full medical staff, massage therapist, everyone in there. So they know... 
it's match day or it's training day the next day, they know who's playing, they know who's on, they know who they have to look after, uh, they know what the session's going to be. Um, we would always send them a copy of the session on their phone so they could see the setup, the layout, when drinks were required. Um, and during that meeting, it was very, very open that people could ask questions, give suggestions, um, talk about things. And then, obviously, the assistant coaches, um, uh, goalkeeper coach, assistant coach, they had particular responsibilities. For example, my, my goalkeeper coach always takes our defensive set pieces. So his role is to review the opponent's attacking set pieces. Um, we have a, a, a structure for the defensive set pieces, but then he will actually run that part of the, the match day preparation session. He'll actually do that because if we change goalkeepers, he knows intimately do they need four in the wall there, three in the wall there, what does he prefer, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, so we would do that. The, they all had roles in terms of video review. They all have roles in terms of um, small group inter, uh, meeting with players. So uh, maybe maybe um, Casey, he would, uh, he would work with the attacking midfielders and strikers and in particular review their stuff, have individual meetings, small group meetings. Um, he might even, if we do a day of training where we do um, small group training before we come together as a group, he would then spend time with them working on a particular theme um, that related to how we wanted to play. Um, so we could zoom in sometimes with individuals, small groups, and, and the coaches were given um, a lot of uh, opportunity there to interact with the players because you've got all that time in camp, utilise it, and then when the game time comes, uh, boys, go and do your thing. I think that's great because it's obviously uh, when you're an assistant coach, I mean, I've been there before, um, you want to feel involved. So I think you know, the approach you've highlighted is, is brilliant. Uh, you know, collective effort. So I think there's some really good insights from what you've explained to us there. Andrew, Andrew they've all had their journey, uh, whether it's a physio, whether it's a coach. Um, why would you employ someone and not utilise what they've got? It's just, it's just, uh, it's common sense. And I think you get a lot more out of them. Um, and here we are six months after the World Cup. If one of our players gets a contract overseas, we have an, a WhatsApp group and they're all celebrating saying what a great kid he is. They're, they're still involved and, and, and the World Cup's long gone. So, um, yeah, it's the only way, I think, to work. Cool. You speak about, obviously, so much work goes in from your team um, at training sessions and before game day. So how do, you, how do you manage game day? Is it much information relayed back to the players or what's the, what's the go-to plan for game day? Probably the key thing is um, we, we took from, from the previous Socceroos um, uh, staff, which was obviously Ange... Uh, Pete Klamoski, Ante Milicic, uh, Tony Franken, they always presented video at halftime. Yeah, so okay. that's probably, and, and we might show three, four clips in total, but I think of all the days where I stood in front of a, a, a tactic board and tried to move their whole teams back four across and then show where someone should move and then my body's in the way and then I'm talking over my shoulder. Um, so... Uh, Prior to the match, we do a lot of preparation in the days leading in if we have the time, but that becomes quite tight in a tournament because you're reviewing your own performance, uh, recovering, uh, giving some information about the opponent, etc. and you've got to be very careful. So we would show that, but we would always make copies of it uh, and send it to the kids on WhatsApp. So actually later. Um, on match day... Uh, usually announce the team around about lunchtime so then they could decide are they having a slightly bigger meal a little bit less what are they doing uh, and then after lunch they could go and uh, disappear for a while and then before we get on the bus it'd be a little motivation meeting because at the ground I don't say much so before they get on the bus they'd come down there might be a piece of fruit they can grab and we would just give them um, a little focus on how they're going to win the game the key things they need to do to win the game and then they're left alone. And when they get to the stadium, the staff have already set up the change room, which is unbelievable how they set it up, the care that they put into it. Um, so the boys walk in and their jerseys are hanging up and the Australian flag is there and there's music playing. And um, uh, then it's their time. Then it's their time. And, and I wait for the opponent's starting 11 to come, maybe talk to my staff a little bit, maybe pull one player and say, look, uh, he's not playing today. He's actually, don't worry. Uh, about uh, what we told you about the marking or this or that. It doesn't happen now. Um, but otherwise, it's their time. And, uh, and that's when the assistant coach, the goalkeeper coach, they all um, have quiet chats. But the leadership group within the team, they, they run the dressing room. They, they um, 
kind of make sure everyone's ready. And then, and then it's just, it's just it's a time to mentally prepare. It's a time to feel relaxed. It's a time to enjoy a good vibe. Um, so not much said there. Uh, half time, I've got my notes. We've been communicating with, the, with someone in the grandstand and our analyst is cutting some clips. The players will come in and do what they need to do. They see the physio, they go to the bathroom, they get a drink, they change shirt, or whatever they need to, they relax. And in that three to four, maybe five minutes there, that's when myself, the assistant coach, and, and the analyst are deciding which clips we're going to show, which clips are actually going to make the point clear. Um, and really, we could get that down to a photograph if we wanted to. But there's nothing better than being able to show the clip exactly where the space is freeze it and say, you see for yourself. And if you want, I can show you 10 clips where that space is there. Yeah. yeah? Then, then really we try and cut that off again after three, four minutes. And then it's a time again to talk to individuals about stuff or if they have questions to ask or whatever. And otherwise, um, a key point, how are you going to win the game? Whether you're ahead, whether you're behind, whether it's level, the next half is how you're going to win the game. Um, but we try to use the video to make that very clear. and, and um, you know, getting feedback from players. If you show too much video, it's confusing. If you show a little bit, it's very clear. And um, and so that's what that's what we have to get right. Right. I know you enjoy bringing guest speakers. Why do you see that as like an effective tool for players? Well, firstly, we utilise our staff a little bit. Um, so um, way back at the beginning of the journey, our um, our He's our equipment manager and massage therapist, um, but a really, really smart guy who's currently doing a master's in, in, in um, sports admin and stuff like that. Uh, sorry, high performance sport. So he's doing massage, but he's, he's about to do a master's in high performance sport. He, he, that, that's the quality of people you have when, you, when you're fortunate enough to work with a national team. And Anthony ran a unbelievable um, uh, meeting, workshop, uh, experience about what it means to play for your national team and got the boys, got the boys standing up in a, in a camp in Narrabeen singing the national anthem with a hand on their heart and from that day onwards uh, every time the national anthem it, it, it was the same yeah um, and uh, he connected the boys right back to their parents their parents had sent in a photograph of their first football experience and they didn't know it but their jersey was hanging on a chair. And when they sat there, they reached under the chair and pulled out a photograph and it was them at four or five, six years of age with their first. So those sort of things we do from within the staff. And then obviously we've been fortunate with, um, uh, when we first left to go to the Asian Cup, um, uh, Steve Corica, um, one of the first players, I think the first player ever to do 17s, 20s, 23s, Socceroos. He came in and presented the jerseys to the boys. Um, he'd just become head coach of CDFC at the time. A little bit later on, uh, we had um, other people come in and, and, and I guess, um, uh, speak to the boys. And, and probably the, the big one was before we went to the World Cup. Um, we did a jersey presentation and a farewell so that some parents could say goodbye to the kids uh, in a way. And uh, we invited Liz Scheinflug to come in. And, and so there we had the head coach from the, the team that went to the World Cup final presenting jerseys to the boys. And he shared a lot of um, passion and, and happy moments with the boys. So I think... All those things is, um, is about connecting, um, in particular with the history and, and, and um, yeah, other people who've given their heart for the jersey, I think is, is, is great that the boys understand that there's a legacy to be had by being involved. Excellent. So as there's been lately a lot of commentary on sort of coaching and playing principles rather than tactical sort of information, What's your view on view on this? I think I think a, a player's journey could be, um, you know, they might, they might be fortunate fortunate to be Steven Gerrard and play at one club their whole career. Um, Messi, fingers crossed, he stays there. Um, uh, or they could change 10, 12 clubs, and in that time, it's really the same as any other employment. You you have a um, a business you're working for. You have a way of functioning which relates to how the coach's vision is, but also about the quality of players around you. Uh, and I think as much as trying to perform and win matches with the Joeys, um, what we are, we're exposing our most talented players to international competition, um, which may mean that someone contacts their club and says, we, we, wanna, we want him, we want to bring him to us. Um, 
but I think to be flexible, to be adaptable um, in your career and apply principles and learnings is, um, gives you longevity in the game, whereas just a very, very prescribed role um, gives you short-term success. So uh, we, we try with the Joeys for them to understand um, uh, and apply simple principles of the game and, and then, then it comes down to who you're playing next to today because it might be a different relationship. It might be a winger who, who likes to receive a defeat and take people on. It might be a winger who likes to run behind. If you don't recognise those moments and just play because someone told you, get it and play it there, I think you miss great opportunities to, to, um, to connect in, in the match. Yeah. With your session designing, as, as it's probably different, obviously, when you're at Westfields and it's more 100% player-centric, to when you're with the Joeys, what, go, what influences go into what you're going to do in your session? How much is focused on what you want and how much is focused on what the other team may be playing like? Yeah, so maybe it depends on the camp. If we're right in the middle of a tournament, um, then we're just doing what the players need. Uh, so if, if, if it could be down to individual needs if some guy needs more recovery than someone else. Um, uh, it, it could be um, um, that we're just preparing for the opponent like you would with any professional team. You just recover, you get their body right, and then you say, okay, uh, you're a fullback. Well, guess what? Their winger this time is actually plays with his opposite foot, so he's going to want to come inside. I don't think that's a... Once they have quality, that's not a major detail. You just need to show them and then, and then yeah. Um, when we have more time, when we have a, a period where we might have two or three camps and some international friendlies where we are testing things out, then definitely we're looking at a, at a guy and we're saying, um, how does he individually carry out the key aspects of his role? If he's a centre-back and his timing on, on the headers is poor, we have to work on it. We can't ignore it at national team level. Um, and he might still be the best centre-back in Australia, but he needs to work on his first reaction when a ball's in flight to assess the flight. We have to address that. So we do a certain amount of work because when they go on, on the pitch, you, you don't want them to have holes in their game that are obvious, you know? Yes, anybody can make a mistake, anybody can slip over, but um, you need to spend some time on the, on the parts of their game um, that they're going to use right through their whole career. So we would do that individually. We do it small group work. Um, uh, if we need to, we 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 spend time um, after training with someone, whether that's on the pitch or with video. Um, but definitely, you have to have a certain amount of time for the individual. Yeah. And in particular, what was interesting at the World Cup is we we obviously you have a group of players who just by nature are starting to play more and some are playing less. And that was an interesting one for me to handle was to put time into the players that weren't starting. Yeah. yeah. To keep their morale up, to show purpose in what they were doing, to make sure that they were ready for a game if I needed them. Yeah. Um, and, and you can't do that if you only ever do things based around the first 11. Makes sense. Um, does your playing style change depending on who you're playing or the players you have available to you? I don't think playing style. I think we, um, we, we want to... <laughs> it doesn't matter what level of football around the world, A-League, La Liga, people get excited when they see combination play. Yep. When they see players interacting and understanding each other and maybe some clever touches on the ball, when they see particularly high-level skill like uh, individual dribbling actions, um, people executing technique while they're moving at speed, so, you know, a heading finish, a, a volleyed finish, someone running onto the ball at speed and being able to play a combination of passes while they're on the move. Um, uh, the ability to shape a pass and weight a pass to put someone into a... It shows your intelligence by where you put someone into an opportunity. Um, so we want to see those things and want to encourage those things. Um, and so our style doesn't change, but maybe a key point about um, pressing triggers might change. Um, so you might actually adjust a little bit more defensively to nullify the opponent's style of play. Are we going to go really deep and press really, really high all the time um, to disrupt their build-up, or don't they care? And also, do the weather conditions enable that? So, for example, we went to press a little bit against Brazil last September in, in England, okay? 
And the statistics show that they played out from the back quite well. But any time that we did really disrupt their build-up, do you know what their centre-halves did? They kicked right. it onto the shoulder of my centre-back. Yeah. Lofted, long pass, just clipped into the space. Not, not a long ball just to nowhere, but clipped there. And he has a choice. Does he head it out of play and give them a throw-in? Does he try and head it down to our midfield? And if he gets it wrong, he drops it at two... Because they were playing basically with two number 10s and two number 9s, basically. So if you get it wrong... You've got four of the best players from Brazil about to have the ball running into the back four. So, and I think that that shows um, a bit of pragmatism in their approach and something we, we have to be mindful of. I often talk to the players about tennis. If the guy's at the net and you never lob him. He can stay there. Yeah? Yep. Um, if there's a, although we have a way we want to play, I think we have to be intelligent. We have to recognise um, different ways of, of, of stretching or challenging our opponent. Uh, yeah. but, but in answer to your question, Kyle, definitely um, we, we want to have a strong identity of who we are. And that means connectedness, that means interplay, that means um, allowing creativity, it means about positive actions. Even if you make a mistake, be positive. Excellent. I guess moving on to the more regional side of things now, do you find anything different with regional players that sets them apart from your Metro players? Yeah, I think, I think maybe if we wind back into the, into the early part of this discussion, I grew up in an area that wasn't football rich. It was dominated by other things. In country areas, the kids have great access to facilities and can play multiple sports, which I think is a huge advantage for them. I'll take an example of Nathan Burns, who, who grew up in Blaney, small town, went on to be a socceroo. Um, uh, his experiences there would have been probably doing everything. Yeah. Um, so in one way, that's a huge advantage for them. The disadvantage is the regular access to high-level competition and challenges. Um, and I think in the country areas, it's quite common that a young, young, talented player gets promoted up age groups and plays with men. And there's a certain point to which that, that has a benefit. But there's also the point where um, those men have their limitations too. So they might have understanding of the game and for a year or two, they might speed him up. But eventually he needs to go where, if I put this example to you, um, I'm sure if I go to a, a training field in Dubbo, I will see a little rondo. Yeah? yeah? And I'll see the same rondo at Sydney FC. And then I'll see the same rondo at Manchester City. But to be in the middle of one of those is a different experience. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah? And so... Um, we don't need to be more complex with what happens. What we need to do is, 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 is for sure, is test ourselves against higher level. And, and so that, that, that is one of the big challenges for country or regional-based kids is, is are they getting the stimulus that, that, that takes them to the next level? Not do they have the desire, not do they have the physical quality, um, but rather do they get enough tests um, that really uh, challenge them, inspire them, and, and help take them to that higher level. So as that leads right into the next question, we speak about um, limited resources, et cetera, for country kids and testing themselves. What advice would you have for them to be able to test themselves, whether they play up an age group or sort of what would you say for them to, to get to that next, that higher level? Yeah, I think, I think so many of those things are dependent upon good coaching out there because some players physically aren't able to play up an age group um, and that might not be the answer for them. Uh, it might be challenging them in their training environment a lot more. Um, but the difficult one is that they're going to have to leave home at some stage. The, the, um, uh, the, um, the A-League venues, they can play a friendly match at, uh, at Mudgee. Yeah. Yeah? But, but they don't play their matches there regularly. And the same as the kid who's playing for um, Sydney FC wants to play in La Liga. Well, the grounds are where they are. You, you, eventually, you eventually have to move close closer and closer to where there's a larger population. And that's a, that's a tough decision for, for um, regional-based kids to make. So how helpful is the National Youth Championships for you in your Joey's role in identifying players regionally from all the states? And then how has the increase of TSB games assisted you to identify those players? And then what's the big test after you've identified some players that have potential? How do you, how do you measure then whether they have it, what it takes to compete at the next level with the other players from across Australia that you have that you bring in. 
Yeah, um, difficult one. So the the national youth championships, they're essential because they provide for a lot of kids a chance to measure themselves against others. Um, they they bring together a large number of players in a short window of time, so you get a bit of a snapshot of what's there across the country. Um, the negative of that is that it's once a year. Yep. Therefore, um, a kid who rolled his ankle last week doesn't go to the nationals. And if that was your way of identifying talent, then you'd be in trouble because you'd miss a lot of good kids. Um, so they're a starting point. If we, if we looked at it like this and said, okay, 250 kids go to a tournament, and that's not all the best talent in Australia because, again, someone didn't get selected for whatever reason, preference of one player over another. Um, someone was injured. Uh, someone just moved and therefore wasn't in a team. But it could be a good starting point. And then from there, what you, you, you should be working back from that list is where were their interesting talents? And then we try to, um, with the TSP and, and with also with elite matches, is try and make sure there's some high level matches on a regular basis in each state. Um, and therefore a kid who was in the National Youth Championships or a kid who wasn't. We're relying on coaches to say, you know what, I saw someone who excited me. Let's get him to an elite match. Let's get him to training with a club at a higher level than what he's at. Um, and if we do it where we try and provide a process study year round and has multiple capture points, there's a chance for a kid to, to be identified. And once they're identified, um, then, then the next thing for me and, and my staff is to watch them as often as possible and to interact with their club and to get feedback how they're training, how's their life going. Then you want to bring them into a camp and, and see how they, how they deal with, um, I suppose there's, there's an innate pressure. You're coming into camp and one thing, you, you're proud when you leave home, but you get there and probably for a little while you look around and go, okay, this is going to be tough. Yep. And, and, and then that, just because someone maybe fails on their first camp doesn't mean they're not for us. Um, and particularly with the Joey's age group, because of the growth and development issues, my squad will change a lot. So the, the, the squad that I started with Pete Klamoski in 2017 to the squad that went to the World Cup, uh, there was probably nearly 20 changes over the time. You know, there's only... There's only um, with players coming out, and there might have been about seven or eight guys who have survived the whole journey. The rest was, was change and change and change because we needed to give someone else an opportunity to see if they were, were able to, to, to take us to another level. Thanks. Um, what do you think coaches regionally need to work on for the younger players? What they need to work on? Yeah, with their players. Yeah, you, so you try and work on what you can affect. Um, if you can't affect the level of competition, um, particularly their, their technical quality, um, their ability to know who they are and who they feel like, because every kid has a, an instinct when they play the game. I've actually got kids who actually like tackling, which is exciting. <laughs> I was in backs for a long time, weren't interested in, in, in the yeah. ball. Uh, it was more about, you know, how, how do I play that angle pass? Um, and I want them to, um, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm happy with the passing, but, yeah. but definitely um, some kids are more combative. They want to be in, in the competitive, in the fight stuff. Some kids love 1v1 and want to do that. And, and we, we need to embrace that, that individual um, difference. So I'd say the coach in the regional area needs to kind of um, see who the kid is a bit like. Who does the kid feel like? Who, do they, who are their, their, their models in the game? Um, and then help them um, learn how to express themselves and use those talents to their full uh, matches. And then what they have to do, they have to be their biggest advocate. They have to be the one banging on the door of Andrew. They have to, then Andrew has to be banging on the door of Warren Grieve and then, or, or Drew to make sure that they're getting into more games. They're not just coming when, when the kids from country New South Wales come in for a camp. They're coming more often because he's just that little bit better because he's, he's, he's showing this desire. And I think once you open the pathway for one player, then several others will be motivated to follow. So he, Everybody in Australia needs to understand at some stage you're passing a player on. It doesn't matter if you live in a metropolitan area or you live in a regional area. Um, if their dream is to be a socceroo, they're not going to be with you forever. They're, they're moving on. Yep. And, and that's either to another club, to another country. Like it. What would your advice be to those players who want to play in the Joeys or professional career long term? Oh, wow. Um, I think um, 
you, you know deep down in your heart whether it's what you want to do the most in your life. Um, when, when kids go up to that next level, when they are part of a national team set up, there's two things. There's one, the, the, oh, my God, look who I'm with. And there's the other side of, oh, my God, look who I'm with. <laughs> yeah? yeah? And we want them to smile when they look around the table and go, what are we going to be able to put together with us? He's so good at that. He's so good at that. He's so smart. He's so technical. I can't wait to play with them. Now, if you want to go into that environment with the best of the best for every other kid around the country that's fought for the chance to wear the jersey and you still want to go in there with a smile on your face and with confidence, then I think um, what, what's going to make you confident? And I think what makes people confident is, is self-belief, is knowing they've done the work. Uh, so particularly this period of isolation should help players understand what I can do for myself by myself. Yep. Uh, Hey, what do I what do I get from the fridge when I go to eat? Do I go for a run when when no one is watching? Do I uh, do more juggling of the ball? Do I knock it up against a wall to work on my touch? Do I every day have the belief and the dream that I want to be a footballer? Um, if you don't have those things, then you need to find a way to motivate yourself in some other way. But when you have those things, then it's, it's just natural. It, it, when I say it's natural, you're just drawn to the ball. You're drawn to anything yep. to do with the ball. Um, and then, like we discussed earlier, having good mentors, whether it's a coach, a family member, a teammate who's a good footballer, an older player within your club who can guide you a bit, um, you, you, you go searching for that. I think that the best players go searching for it. They don't wait for it to come to them. They, they ask questions. They're proactive. Um, and so a little bit, it is in their nature. But, but um, if you know you have a shortfall in some way, um, the ones who love the game the most will will will, um, will persist. They just don't give up. They don't stop. Yeah, yeah, it's good advice. I suppose just before we wrap up, um, what's what's next for your coaching journey, or what does the future hold for Trevor? Uh, so at the moment, I, I I have to prepare a team to play in the Asian Cup, and I also stay, need to start looking at the kids born two thousand and six. The only thing is we don't know when we can have a camp again. We don't know when the tournament will be exactly. Uh, so everything at the moment is um, uh, a few options that you have laid out. And then, then now, once you start to get information that guides you, one's more likely to happen, then you start to head in that direction. But we have at the moment an extended list of 40 players that we're contacting, that we're, in, we're, we're, we're working with at the moment, uh, who would have been at a tournament, who potentially would have been at a tournament in um, Qatar and Serbia in April. Um, we, we were supposed to be in England in, in August to play England and USA and it looks like uh, I'm not so hopeful that's going to happen um, and, and the Asian Cups are meant to be in Bahrain in September so they're the, they're the main um, tournament action things that were supposed to be happening this year around that there's the Tunnel ID there's the scouting there's the reporting there's the uh, communication with clubs there's the watching them play um, we have some players overseas we're watching as well so all of that's trying to continue, but it's going to be great when football's back and we can yeah. watch them live uh, and we get some indication of when, when actual um, the timeline will, will all sort of come to, to fruition. Excellent. Well, we're all champing in a bit for football to return properly. Thanks for your time uh, today with us. We certainly appreciate your, your insights. You've had some fantastic advice and certainly um, had some really positive comments that... I'm sure we will receive. So thanks very much for joining us, Trev. We appreciate it very much. My pleasure, gents. Have a good day. No worries. Thanks, Trev. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor.